Fantastic, Mark. Uh, thank you for inviting myself and, and Mark Phillips of, of Helium. Uh, my name is uh, Lee Babcock and I live in Frederick. I'm also a Helium network operator with hotspot hosts in Frederick County, Montgomery County, Baltimore County, and uh, two of them at UMD where my son is in computer science. Uh, my Helium story began, and I think Juan, you might appreciate this. You mentioned December 2019 previously. My Helium story began on December 5, 2019, when I was listening to this uh, Delphi Digital podcast. It's a crypto podcast, and it was an interview of Amir Hallam, who's the founder and CEO of, of uh, Helium. And uh, uh, so, you know, I mean, I now have 10 hotspots deployed, and I just received my last batch of four. So I need to look to, I need to deploy them as well. Uh, so, you know, with that, you know, I'm pleased to introduce Mark Phillips, uh, who is Vice President of Business Development at Helium. Uh, and Mark does an absolutely fantastic job telling the Helium story and transferring knowledge about the Helium technology. So with that, please take it away, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Um, and thanks for inviting me to speak at this group. Um, you know, as Lee mentioned, he is a very active network uh, member, active community member, uh, big huge helium advocate uh and he's given me the opportunity to speak to a handful of groups uh so i appreciate that lee and uh quite frankly we couldn't have a better ambassador so um if you're looking for an example of why helium has grown so quickly um lee is you know exactly the reason why so all right so as i mentioned before i've got about five slides they'll be fast um and we can sort of go into an open discussion i don't love slides but like i said because i've got some that are just kind of fresh and usually slides are old I'm gonna I'm gonna use them. So um, can people see this? And I'll share these after the talk to you. I'll, I'll drop a PDF into this, and, uh, and people can uh, can have them. Um, is this seeable? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, the idea behind Helium is that we've figured out how to use individuals to create wireless networks. That's that's the biggest thing you should sort of take away from this talk. So um, you know. Uh, Lee mentioned that our CEO is named uh, Mir Halim, and he saw him on a, a, a he said Delphi Digital, maybe some sort of podcast or a talk. Um, he, uh, he he was founded a, the company. He was a world champion. He was some kind of world champion. Oh, game. His story is fascinating. Yeah, so he he was born in um, uh, he was born in the UK. Uh, he studied computer science and and AI in like I don't know uh, like the nine. Um, early 2000s, like he's, he's fairly young, um, and decided that he was going to be like a play video games. And uh, I don't know if anybody here has played Quake or Quake 2 or some other weird variation of Quake, but around 2000, 2001, um, just as he was you know, in university, uh, he became the number one or number two Quake player in the world, um, which is pretty wild. Like he was you know, doing e-gaming essentially before anybody else was. This is when it was a very small community, but still wildly competitive. Uh, and he actually used his gamer status to uh, get an athlete visa into the United States. Uh, and so that's sort of what brought him to the U.S. And they did a series of startups uh, around gaming and, and advertising and ultimately um, ended up founding Helium back in 2013 with uh, Sean Fanning, who people might remember from Napster. Um, so, sorry. So, um, you know, we've sort of landed on this innovation where we've, we've used this thing called the Helium blockchain. So it's a, it's a new blockchain. Uh, and I'll get into some of the specifics. Um, we created it from the ground up um, specifically to incentivize the creation of decentralized wireless networks. And so hopefully the point of the real takeaway from this talk, um, aside from the fact that the blockchain here is like the kind of a huge innovation, is that it can be used for any sort of wireless network. So we don't actually tie the blockchain to, you know, what in this case right now is, is LoRaWAN. I called it an LP WAN before, but uh, the version of you know, LP WAN that we're using is called LoRaWAN, which is made for small devices and small device data, um, but it can be used to instigate the creation of Wi-Fi networks or 4G, LTE, or even 5G networks, right? So um, there's a remarkable amount of potential there. Um, so let's see. So just some stats here. So we have the largest contiguous public LoRaWAN network in the world, right? So at this point, um, I'll, show, I'll show a link in a, in a minute to the Helium Explorer. But, excuse me, there's Helium coverage in 3,000 cities across 60 countries, which is absolutely bonkers, right? Considering that in July of 2019, there was nothing. In August of 2019, we were in Austin, Texas. And then in um, uh, October of 2019, we actually started shipping hardware to people who had ordered them, like very, very early bleeding edge adopters. 
So we've really only been rolling out coverage since October of 2019. Uh, and at this point, like I said, 3,000 cities, 60 countries, there's 18,000 gateways out there. We call them hotspots, but it's, uh, if you're not, um, you know, if, if you're more sort of familiar with radio and wireless, um, you can call it gateway. Um, but there's 18,000 hotspots live. Um, we project that there's gonna be over 150,000 by the end of 2021. Quite frankly, we could probably be pretty close to 150,000 now had we not had supply issues when it come, came to manufacturing gateways um, and, and some of uh, issues related to, to, to making it easier to trust new nodes in the network. And I can talk about that. Um, but we should be alleviating that supply issue fairly quickly in the next couple months with our partners. And so we're continued to sort of explode the growth. Um, we saw a lot of early adopters. So people like Lee, um, no, <laughs> Lee, Lee knows a lot about wireless, or I guess more than no, that. No, no, as he said, I'm learning. Yeah, yeah. but as you, you know, as you said before, like you're not a ham radio operator, right? You, you know, you, you weren't anyways. Um, and yeah. you haven't, you know, historically known much about antennas and, yeah. you know, yeah. signal strength and FSPL and all sorts of wild stuff, right? Um, but the incentive. incentive. I took my ham radio license that I, I understood enough about the antennas to kind of like start thinking about helium. That's how that yeah. happened for me. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, the incentive infrastructure, right? The idea that this helium blockchain was rewarding people in this thing called HNT really is what drove the initial uh, and continues to drive the build out. And so specifically, the incentive is built around something called proof of coverage. So for those of you who are familiar with blockchain, you know, Bitcoin has proof of work. Um, Ethereum is moving to something called proof of stake. Uh, Helium uses something called proof of coverage, which is um, uh, something that we have designed to basically enable people to prove that they are providing wireless coverage in the physical world. And we're, we're sort of layering on, on proof of stake, actually. I can sort of talk about that if people want to, but the proof of coverage is the fundamental sort of innovation here when it comes to work in the Helium blockchain. And so as you participate in the network, your hotspot gets plugged in, uh, you give it a uh, backhaul to the internet, um, and then you project this long range network, this lower wind network, just by virtue of the fact that it's online providing coverage and as being a good network citizen, you're earning HNT. And so when we talk about coverage, these are what the sort of set of gateways or hot, uh, what the hotspots in the network look like now. So this first one here is the Helium hotspot, the one that Helium produced. We made I don't know, 15,000 of these things. They're all sold out. You can't get them. <laughs> they sell on eBay for like two or $3,000. Um, and that's primarily what the network is made up of now. Um, this thing in the, on the right side here is called the Rack hotspot miner. So this was the second approved gateway that came out of the community. And so the community now has a process. Uh, it's called HIP19. And I can talk about what HIPs are and Helium improvement proposals, where we, we get applications from manufacturers who are capable of supplying the, the caliber of hardware that meets the security and sort of performance requirements. And then the community will either approve or not approve their application. And then once they're approved, they can go ahead and produce gateways and sell them to the community that participate in the blockchain. So this one is from Rack. Um, they've sold, I don't know, 25, 30,000 of these things in the last six months. They continue to have a backlog. Um, I can, I'll, I'll send some links around for people to sort of check out and maybe buy one of these if they want to. Um, oh, sorry about this. Uh, over here is one from, two from a company called Nebra. So there's an indoor unit and then an outdoor unit. Um, these guys are based in the UK. They make awesome uh, hardware. Uh, they're associated with a group called Pi Supply. So if you bought a Raspberry Pi, you might have bought something from Pi Supply. That's the same group. And then this one down here is called, <laughs> this is my favorite. It's called the Bobcat, which is just amazing. Um, it's manufactured by a Chinese company called Easy Lincoln, and they're selling models for uh, China and a few different um, uh, parts of the world. I think North America, EU, and maybe like Australia or something. Um, so that's the Bobcat. So these are these are all the, the models that are now on the network that can be bought and deployed and, and onboarded to the blockchain to provide helium network coverage and mine HNT. Um, and we'll have many more manufacturers that are coming online in the next few months. So um, fundamentally, the incentive structure is built around this thing called proof of coverage. Um, and oh, I have left here. Okay. And so proof of coverage is the idea that when you deploy a gateway, right? So over here, I think this is actually San Francisco. Um, you are providing coverage, right? The, the gateway is projecting or, or um, listening, right? For LoRaWAN radio packets. Um, and so, you know, in San Francisco, uh, if you have a sensor anywhere in San Francisco or the Bay Area, it's going to get through. Like our network coverage is fantastic. Um, along while that's happening, um, your gateway is constantly being challenged, to sort of prove that it can hear packets. We call them beacons or proof of coverage beacon packets. Uh, and so what happens is one gateway is sort of 
uh, instructed by the network to issue a, a packet, right? To send off a radio packet, um, that's a LoRaWAN packet. And then any other gateway that can hear it is called a witness. And so over time, uh, you're constantly witnessing packets and the blockchain is recording that you're witnessing things. And so we get a very good uh, map and sort of uh, a, a blockchain verified history of the resiliency of this LoRaWAN coverage on the Helium network. And so as I note here, although we started with LoRaWAN, you can use the same proof of coverage model pretty much in any wireless network. And we're sort of moving down that path. I can get to that if people want. Um, and so these are a few examples of what the coverage actually looks like. So this is a site called uh, Mappers, and I'll, I'll put a link up to this, but mappers.helium.com. So on the left, if you look closely, you can see this in Chicago. And on the right, you can see this is Oakland. So this is Bay Area. San Francisco's down here across the Bay. Um, and if, again, if you go to mappers.helium.com, there's a legend to tell you what all these things mean. But um, the tiny, tiny dots are hotspots. So these are where people have actually deployed hotspots. And these hexagons, so um, the, the Helium universe is broken up into hexagons. Uh, using a library called H3 from Uber, which is pretty useful. Um, you can see coverage, right? So uh, the, the, all you're seeing here is is mapped coverage, meaning people in the community out there with GPS enabled, uh, they're called mappers, these little, you can buy one off the shelf or make them. And they're just doing, like people will sit in cars and drive up and down blocks and take bikes up and down blocks. It's pretty fascinating. And so, um, you know, the signal strength uh, is sort of shown here based on the shading of the hexagon. I forget if it's, um, I think better signal strength is the lighter colors and darker signal strength is, uh, or darker colors is, is, is um, less good, but ultimately still useful. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't mean that there's no coverage here. It just means that it hasn't been mapped, right? So um, same thing over here, right? Just because there's no hexes over here doesn't mean there's no coverage. Uh, in fact, I know for a fact that some of the hotspots in downtown Oakland reach, you know, like 10, 15 miles out of this area. Um, uh, it just means that it hasn't been mapped yet. And so, um, so what we're starting to see is, uh, you know, early days, the first you know, five, 6,000 hotspots on the network, it was these sort of um, bleeding edge sort of blockchain crypto enthusiasts who pay attention to all new projects and said, oh, you know, I'll spend 300, 400, $500 to sort of see what this is all about. It's a new miner, right? No mind this thing that I've never heard of. Um, and it provides something useful for as wireless coverage, right? There's already devices using this, which is super cool. I mean, most most of the issues that we take with the sort of blockchain space, and, and I'll say that we got into it reluctantly. Like we didn't have a, you know, the first five years of Helium's life had nothing to do with blockchain. We were just building an IoT infrastructure. Um, we, we, we truly sort of had to do this because in our mind, it was the only way to solve the coverage problem. So we, we started with hobbyists and bleeding edge crypto enthusiasts. Uh, we saw people like Lee, right, get addicted to it and start to deploy. And you know, he said he's got 10 hotspots now. He's waiting on some more. Like, it's once you get one, you're kind of like, oh, man, how do I get to five? And then how do I get to 10? Uh, and again, the, the cost for most people is not crazy, right? A few hundred dollars uh, here and there, pool some money with your friends, start to build out good locations. And you can start putting really good network coverage on the map and start seeing yourself you know, participating in a huge way in the network. And so that sort of took us to the next phase. And then recently, I would say in the last six months, we've started to be embraced by these people who had deployed very telco grade sort of infrastructure and either already have assets in the field that are, are deployed for other LP WAN or even cellular stuff and are repurposing them or adding helium to their towers or are doing sort of net new uh, infrastructure deployments with, uh, with helium. And so um, while, you know, a lot of people who are getting started are putting hotspots in windows, which is still great. You can provide fantastic coverage, like on the second, third floor of a house with a stock antenna that we ship. Um, what we're starting to see is this, this stuff, like this one on the left is, um, I think it's San Diego area. Like these guys who put this up, uh, they're part of a group called, um, I forgot what their actual group name is, but they, like, they have a company that deploys network coverage and they sell services on top of Helium. They hiked like six hours up some hill with like everything they needed to deploy this thing. And this is like the most absurd, you know, solar powered, cellular backed hotspot. And it probably does uh, like upwards of 400 or 500 square miles worth of helium coverage. It's absolutely bonkers. Um, this one over here on the right is in the Bay Area. So, uh, I think it's a guy named Joey, um, who's Joey Hiller, super active in the community, puts up fantastic deployments. Um, and so again, this is the hotspot here, and this is the sort of housing he built with the, the antenna, and that's maybe a 5.1 dBi antenna, and then um, a few other ones from somewhere in the Midwest. So um, that's that's kind of a summary of the, what the network is all about. Um, Lee had mentioned a hotspot name as I started to come online. Lee, what was the name of your hotspot? Mine is Tangy Pink Goose. Do you mind if I use it to demonstrate the network? Go ahead, go ahead. All right, so this is explorer.helium.com. 
and so I would recommend people spend some time here. If somebody wants to drop a link to that in whatever chat mechanism is in Jitsi, I'd be appreciative. Or I can do it after. And so if ever you want to know anything about the network, this is all public data. Um, you can come here. So for example, you can see that there's about 17,900 hotspots. If you click on this, you know, um, oh, about 15,000 of those are online. Not too bad, 81%. Um, we're in 3,000 cities, 60 countries. Um, and you can sort of see the growth trajectory here. You know, we were at 3,300 in May, uh, six months ago. And then we were at, uh, you know, we hit 10,000 right around uh, October. <laughs> and now, uh, you know, we're upwards of 17, eight. Um, I can tell you that that number will be probably closer to 50,000 by the end of March, right? So, I mean, it's just the, the growth is wild. Um, and there's this hotspot map, which I would encourage people to check out. So you can go to helium.com or explore.helium.com slash coverage and see this. These are these will come online sort of in the order that they uh, that they are deployed. Um, so, yeah, um, zoom in, zoom out. You can actually search by city up here. You can go, I don't know, one of the best cities of late is uh, Stockholm, for example. There's like remarkably good helium coverage in Stockholm. And that's the group, one of the groups I was mentioning that's like a telco provider repurposing um, existing locations across the Nordics starting in Stockholm. So uh, if we take Lee's hotspot, I'm sorry, it was, what was it again, Lee? Tangy Pink Goose. That was my original okay. hotspot. Yeah. And so the network, when you onboard a hotspot, it gives you the, it gives it a name. It's a library uh, that you can see on GitHub um, that will, uh, here we go, that um, that generates these three three letter names and people love them. Uh, we get a lot of emails, people saying like, hey, can I change the name? <laughs> Sadly, you can't. Some of the names are less exciting than others. I would say tangy, tangy pink goose is above average. So, all right, so this is, uh, where are we looking at? Is this Frederick? Somewhere that's the incentive to set up more nodes so you can get you know cooler names. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Oh, we do have some collisions too. The library only has so many uh, um, uh, options and uh, even though there's like billions of potential names, I think, you know, we've already had a couple of collisions. It doesn't change how Rothspot operates. They all get this unique um, key uh, on the network. So the name is just sort of a thing. Anyways, so this is you know, the area where uh, Lee's got a couple hotspots. You know, if you sort of scroll through here, you can see what it's up to, right? So it's online, it's creating challenges. So a challenge is um, uh, issuing a challenge to the network will instigate the sort of proof of coverage um, test. Um, it's participating in challenges, which is great. So all basically um, the, the different sort of activities that your hotspot is doing um, will will dictate how much h and it could earn. So if you're creating a challenge, that's great. Yeah, but so we I'm, not, I'm not doing any uh, uh, witnessing on my tangy pink goose. No, you're not witnessing anything. Um, two new hotspots, lively current fish and clever citron fish. I mean, in the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah. All right, let's take a look at that. So we can uncheck that and. Oh, uh, let's see. So we can go down here and see what Lee's hotspot has been up to. So, right, so these 0.08 HNT rewards, that's, at this point, that's pretty much the, the amount of HNT you're gonna earn every time you issue a challenge. Um, let's, for the sake of uh, conversation, let's do, um, let's do one that I know does quite well. So this do one's my, called Dandy. Do my sons, do my son, scrawny, roughly pig. Scrawny. You'll like this one, Mark. It's, it's funny that you, you mentioned your sons. Um, uh, it, what we see, <laughs> what we're seeing is like families getting very excited about doing this together, which is which is great to me. My dad and my brother actually have been doing like a, a lot of hotspots hotspot deployments, and uh, they have been like historically like they haven't had the best relationship, but HNT and helium has actually brought them together. It's, it's just a wonderful thing. Okay, yeah. so scrawny rusty pig. All right, so this is um, your son's hotspot, right? So we have you know rewards in the last uh, twenty four seven days, thirty days, so um, pretty solid. And then again, we can go down here. Okay, so bigger HNT rewards. So what's going on is um, the pig here is doing more witnessing, right? So um, we reward different things at a higher or lower rate depending on the value of the network. So if you're only issuing challenges, that's interesting to us, but we've issued like, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight million challenges. Um, it's less interesting. Uh, witnesses are a lot more interesting. So if you look here, we can see that, um, this was earned for a POC witness. And I think if I, let's see here, click through here. So this is a transaction. Again, this is all public blockchain data. So we can see actually what's going on. So um, we'll scroll down. So the challenger, 
just to walk you through this. So the challenger can be anywhere on the network, right? So if I look at where what this challenger is, um, this faithful cinnamon chimpanzee lives in Golden, Colorado, right? Obviously, there's no wireless layer. Um, like you're not getting a, a LoRaWAN packet. Damn, that thing is significant. Um, you're not getting a LoRaWAN packet that goes from Colorado to uh, Maryland. So that happens over the internet, right? So the golden uh, or the, the chimpanzee issues a challenge, and this just happens in the background. You don't actually have to do this yourself; it just happens. Um, and then where did it go? Okay. And then what happens is there are people who do witness it. So we scroll down here and we see that the fancy magenta ferret was a valid witness, and there's parameters that make it valid or invalid. And the scrawny rusty pig also a valid witness. So and we've got some stats, right? So it heard the witness packet at 90, negative 94 dBm, which is pretty strong, pretty good signal strength. Um, similar down here, uh, and it's got different SNR stats and distance, and we give you the data rate that was used, which is a very lower WAN specific thing. So yeah, so um, uh, <laughs> my dad actually called me up yesterday. He's like, hey, your brother John's hotspots are in a lot more HMT than me. What the hell's going on? Like that's a, he's, he's witnessing things, right? He, he's hilarious. His hotspot's actually talking to my sister's hotspot, which is like a mile and a half away. Uh, and so anyways, that, that's the general, that, that's what a proof of coverage challenge is. I would encourage people to sort of poke around the network map um, in, the, in the Explorer. It's a fantastic resource. Um, it's developed, all this stuff I'm talking about here is open source um, and developed entirely in the open in, in, um, in GitHub and in Discord. So um, uh, if people want to get involved, uh, you can you know start writing code, filing issues. It's, it's, it's like a huge community collaboration. Um, all right, last thing. I'll mention before we sort of get to questions, because I'm sure people have questions. And I, I actually have a, um, a commitment at 11, so apologies for having to go early. Um, uh, man, this is like the chimpanzee really must like have a remarkable antenna because uh, it is really working hard. Um, okay, so uh, this is helium.com. If you need you know, any more information, certainly go here. Uh, you should take note of a few things. So we just actually shipped new developer documentation like two days ago. So docs.helium.com is all new. Uh, it's primarily the same content from before, but just much nicer and organized and more streamlined. Um, if you want information about the blockchain, you head to the blockchain section. Um, if you want information about how to mine HNT, you go here and you read up. Uh, I mentioned that we're adding new hotspot manufacturers. Uh, so you can start sort of looking around at these. Um, you can also build your own gateway that can act as a packet forwarder, but can't mine HNT just yet. And so we're probably two to three months away from letting people mine some amount of HNT with a gateway that they've built themselves. But for the moment, um, to, to start mining HNT, you gotta go through one of these approved makers and there's a whole process behind um, sort of how it works and why they're, you know, they have to get approved. So yeah, um, other than that, uh, I'll take some questions, but hopefully that was useful for the group. Mark, how do I connect to this net? Like, what, how do I, can you can you give us an overview of mm -hmm. what it means, yeah. like the actual? Yeah, so I didn't talk too much about the device side, right? right? So we, in terms of we, uh, challenges and witnesses. So, sorry, so you want to know how devices actually use the network? Yeah, let's start there. Yeah, so I don't know why this is working. Oh, interesting, maybe there's a bug here. So uh, if you are a developer and you want to use the network, um, oh, that link was bad too. Nice job, guys. That's me. I can make fun of it because I did this. Um, so right. So if you want to use the network, you start here, right? So we support any device that uses LoRaWAN. Uh, if, it, if it's current using LoRaWAN as of 1.0.x, I think 1.0.2 specifically, um, you can get a device in the network. And so although we only got five devices here listed, um, there's literally thousands that will work and we're working on documenting those. In addition to that, we've got a whole bunch of development boards that people um, can use to sort of test the network. And so for example, this Helltech cube cell is a great option. Like it's super cheap. Uh, I think it costs like 10 or $11. We've got a couple of good manufacturing partners in the community that make these and distribute those. Uh, and so if you want to get started, you know, you come here to the Arduino guide and you'd sort of get up and running. It takes all of, you know, a few minutes. There's some code involved, but it's really straightforward. And if you have any questions while you're doing this, uh, you hop into the community and you go to the console channel or the sensor development channel and people will get you up and running super fast. Um, so, you know, when you have a device in hand, whether it's one prototyping board or 50,000, um, you know, uh, temperature monitors, uh, you uh, need what's called a, you go to console. So I'll walk you guys through console. Okay, so this is console, console.helium.com, entirely free to use. This is our cloud-based um, developer interface for deploying devices and uh, managing big device fleets. 
And so uh, I'm in an organization here. Let's switch an organization to this one. Okay, so this is um, uh, an organization. I think this is actually like a property management group uh, that I uh, am friendly with, and so they won't get too upset at me showing their data. So um, they've got not too many devices, seven you know, deploy to the network. Um, you can see some stats here. Uh, most of them are sending data pretty currently. I think it looks like a couple of their sensors are offline. One hasn't sent it in a, they might've run on a battery. This thing's been online for a while. Um, and so you get some some stats about it. Uh, devices get a name. Uh, we can go look at one real quick. And I'm gonna put this open in the event that we get lucky. Ah, oh, mind. So, you know, LoRaWAN IDs, device EUIs, app EUIs, app keys, um, and packet statistics. And then we've got this thing called labels. So labels are sort of how you group sensors programmatically. And so you use a label to, to sort of dictate where it goes. Um, you scroll down here, you can sort of see all this uplink stuff. So um, we've got a uh, sensor here. This is a temperature sensor from a company called uh, Tectelic. Sends temp data, humidity data, and then uh, it's got like a, a motion sensor on it. Um, and so it's actually talking to this hotspot called the striped Citron Vulture. And so what's super cool is if I go take this thing uh, and go to explore and put in striped Citron Vulture. Uh, so I can go check this out and okay. So if I scroll down, uh, what you'll see here is these things. So packets transferred, right? So one data credit worth of data, and I'll talk about what a data credit is. But this data credit is what you're seeing here inside of console. This is um, the data flying through the Stripe Citron Vulture. Um, and what you can also see is that it's getting rewarded for this. So um, the reward weight, reward, reward rate uh, for data credits for actually sending data is pretty low right now uh, relative to what the rest of the network does. Uh, but you're still earning HNT every time you uh, you fire a packet through your gateway to sort of provide that value to the end user. So um, in console, we can see that we've got some integrations here. Data Cake, which is a fantastic IoT UI, uh, and then uh, um, this thing called Foxrock, which is just like a um, it's the name of the, the company actually. So that's that. Um, if you want to add a device in a unit of one, you come here and you give it a name and you. <coughs> Um, you use the device EUI that the sensor has been shipped with, and usually they do, or you create one and then you flash it to the firmware. Then you can add a label if you want to in the same in the same uh, UI. If you want to import devices, uh, you can add it from a CSV. Uh, we also have uh, a um, docs.com. We also have a uh, an API to use for console. So if you want to do um, a bunch of devices on mass, you can do here using the API. And there's a command line interface for console to hit this API if you want to. So that's how we do that. Um, so for example, we just had a company called um, Nobel Systems. We just did a great webinar with them. Um, fired up about 15,000, uh, or uh, sorry, 1,500 parking meter sensors in um, in LA, and they use the, the CLI for that. So um, last couple things to mention. So the idea of data credits is not something I've talked about too much. So um, you need a data credit to send data. That's the sort of transaction fee. There's lots of transaction fees on the blockchain. So for adding a hotspot, for asserting the location of a hotspot, for sending h &T, uh, for um, and for sending data, it requires data credits at a different rate, depending on sort of level of difficulty that we want to sort of um, impose, I guess. So for every 24 bytes worth of LoRaWAN payload, you're sending a data credit. You're spending a data credit. And so the way that you make data credits is actually burning HNT. So it's a blockchain specific transaction called a uh, burn. So you take one HNT and you burn it and it produces some number of data credits depending on the market rate of HNT. Um, we've got some good documentation on this. So I'd recommend people read it if they have questions. But suffice it to say, uh, you know, Lee, for example, with his 10 hotspots, he's, he's earning HNT at some rate. Uh, whenever he wants to put devices on the network, he can burn that HNT to pay for all the data traffic. And we're starting to see companies basically build that into their, into their models such that um, you know they're they're pulling 10, 15, 100 hotspots for enterprise IoT deployments, uh, like that uh, you know Nobel Systems doing the parking sensor deployment in Los Angeles. I think they deployed 18 hotspots or something, or 18 gateways. Uh, they're earning HNT, and they're using that HNT to pay not just for the traffic for the sensors, uh, but also for the cellular backhaul that is happening on those gateways too. So they convert that HNT and they pay for cellular backhaul based out of that. So it's pretty, it's a pretty remarkable sort of ecosystem and the way that the network works. Um, mm -hmm. that, I, can, I can do more on this, but I think maybe that's enough. The, I think that got me started on the right path. I'm gonna ask the dumb question. Mm -hmm. What data am 
I sending? Like, l- let's say that I have an antenna in my, mm-hmm. you know, that I've, that I've purchased, I've hooked it up mm-hmm. to my internet connection. What yeah. data am I sending? Yeah, so you're sending uh, sort of two things, right? So um, your your uh, hotspot is participating in the Helium blockchain. So you're sending all sorts of blockchain data back and forth, right? You're transmitting your status to the network. You're receiving, you know, blocks or right? actual data from the network that gets sent to you, and you have to sync that locally to your to your copy of the blockchain on the on the gateway itself. Um, that's the majority of the traffic that's being sent from your device. Uh, we are in the process of actually moving the blockchain off of the gateways, and I can talk about that if that's interesting. But primarily, you know, 99.96% of the data that's flying out of your hotspot and into your hotspot is blockchain data that's entirely encrypted. Now, when devices do send data through your hotspot, they're basically sending this. Um, and of course, you as a hotspot operator have no insight into what's what's flying through. It's entirely encrypted, both at the lower WAN level, and then additionally on top of that, most companies do additional encryption on top of the standard encryption for lower WAN packets. But this is what the actual payload, you know, would look like if you were to sort of decrypt it. So you get things about app UI, dev UI, dev address, um, all sorts of lower WAN stuff that gives hotspot statistics. Um, so yeah, so th- those two things. Does that answer your question? When you say someone sends data through my hotspot or gateway, or, or I'm, I apologies, I'm not, uh, my, the vocabulary is, is still built is this So if, if I'm walking down, if someone's walking down my street, are they able to see a network like on their cell phone and be able to connect they, and send data through it? Uh, no. So the only, the, you know, the network is specifically built for these small, the small data coming from IRT sensors. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, the closest thing to that sort of thing would be this coverage map. Right, okay. uh, where you would have to say, like, you know, I want to go to Stockholm and deploy a sensor, and say, oh, okay, you know, there's there's data there, or you could go to to or sorry, there's coverage there, or you could go to mappers.helium.com, and again, just because you don't see coverage doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just doesn't mean it's been mapped yet. Um, so I think Stockholm has been doing some mapping. So you would look at this and say, uh, where are you, Stockholm, up here? Uh, it's London. Burr, 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 burr. You look at this and say, okay, there's there's coverage. Um, let me just go with Amsterdam and like Rotterdam, for example. Like, great, awesome. Like, if I want to take a bike and put a location tracker on it, it's going to work. And this is like that's exactly what this is. Like, this is a guy doing a bike road trip over here. So, uh, yeah, that's that's the closest equivalent. Uh, and okay. to add to that, Fox, you know, I mean, there's uh, sensors out there that farmers can use that measure soil moisture soil salinity, soil pH, um, and you just stick it in the ground and the battery life in these sensors might last, you know, five or six years. And that sensor with its little itty bitty antenna is going to send off a data stream every five minutes or whatever frequency of time that you so choose into the helium network. And so that's the kind of data that's being sent in the case of that one type of sensor. But that sensor technology is now being deployed to, to basically sense and detect and smell all kinds of different you know it's it's amazing and it's you know i was just in another conference recently and a a gentleman was describing that by 2024 we're going to have a tidal wave of one trillion devices right so helium is a part of that tidal wave um anybody guess what this is somebody put a a locator on a plane yeah we tell them not we tell them not to because um, because the coverage is too good. Like this is not a good test of coverage, right? You're transmitting data from 20,000 feet in the air and you're going to get heard by something that's probably over here, for example. Uh, but yeah, this is somebody um, uh, with a mapper on a plane flying from, it looks like uh, Atlanta to Jefferson City. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah. Um, what other questions do people have? No. I've got maybe maybe a dumb question. <laughs> Who are your customers in, in the sense of people using sensors? Um, I think Lee mentioned farmers, but who? how do people get involved? I mean, we've talked a lot about how people get involved with expanding the network and getting their own hotspot, yeah. but how do people get involved in, in terms of having their own devices um, hooked yeah. up to send data? 
Yeah, so so you know you can do everything that I just showed you without ever talking to Helium, right? If you have a, a hotspot and you're creating your own coverage uh, or deploying them to create coverage in a specific geography, or coverage happens to exist, typically it's sort of a combination of both. Like people see some coverage that's out there, but they supplement it and, and it sort of works. Um, then you you know you just buy hardware, you make sure that you're provisioned to console, uh, you've programmed some firmware, and it's, you can just get things on the network. As long as you have data credits in your account to pay for the traffic, then it just sort of works. Um, Helium's customers, we have a pretty different business model than pretty much any sort of network provider. All these companies that are in the lower wind space or even the cellular space, uh, when you're looking at IoT, have built these, these very ridiculous business models based on like, number of sensors per month build, you know, for a fixed amount of data and then with overages, um, then there's like, uh, you know, activation fees and deactivation fees. We don't have literally any of that stuff. So the only thing that you pay is a data credit and the, the, the cost is always known, meaning um, if you're going to send one packet of data, it costs you a data credit, which, which has a known cost. If you're going to send a thousand packets of data, it, it has a known cost and it's exactly the same. So, um, you know, we've, uh, I would recommend you go to the Helium YouTube, um, channel we've got a lot of good videos recently with webinars that we've done with customers so companies like nobel systems which i already mentioned which is doing the parking lot sensor monitoring which is super slick and cool um, we've got companies like naui sensors which does a leak detection monitoring system for like residential and commercial business unit, businesses uh, or um, uh, condos right so uh, they can put a, a flow sensor on a pipe in your basement and basically use some pretty interesting um, machine learning to tell you that, yes, you've used 30% more water in the last week than you did the previous five weeks. And, you know, it's probably an issue with your toilet, right? They're, they're saving landlords like um, hundreds of dollars a month uh, based on some, some simple monitoring. Uh, that all uses the Helium network. Um, great tech company out of Texas, another recent example called Lone Star. So they deploy, I think they've got like 50,000 plus sensors across the United States that do everything from cattle tracking to temperature monitoring at um, uh, restaurants, for example. Um, so, so those are a handful of recent examples. Uh, another one that I'm super excited about is a company called uh, Victor Mousetraps, which um, we'll be doing a webinar with those guys in probably two or three weeks. And so they make, I don't have one with me, but quite literally a, a, a smart mousetrap, which is quite funny because that's always the joke that people make about better mousetraps. Uh, and it's got a LoRaWAN module in it and it's provisioned to the Helium network. And you have an app on your phone called the VLink app, which is their product. Uh, you scan a QR code, you bang in a few things in the app and say, okay, it's in my house, it's on the second floor. And then it sends a few packets across the LoRaWAN network and says, okay, you know, you're activated. And it's just, it's there, right? The, the battery lasts, I don't know, seven years. Um, it sends a packet a day if there's no activity. And then if it captures and kills a, a mouse or a rat, it sends a message to the network and you get a, it, I mean, you're laughing about it. It's the greatest IoT application I've literally ever seen. Um, I, I was, it is uh, a mouse trap. <laughs> I was tweeting about this recently. I gave, I bought four of these for Christmas for my friends and family. I gave one away on Twitter because I love this thing so much. It's not that cheap. It costs like a hundred bucks uh, and the price is going to come down, but you literally, you put it in your basement and uh, you put some peanut butter in the thing and uh, like, you get a notification on your phone and it's like, oh, like the, I call mine like the, the mouse house or something. It's like, oh, the mouse house has a, a mouse. And like you wake up and go downstairs before the kids get there and you're like, oh, there's a mouse in it. I think I've captured like six mice in the last six months in my house. Um, and, you know, I don't love the fact that I have mice, but I'm in an old house and whatever, that's a thing. So uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Like it's, and for that industry, it's sort of changing the game because um, there's a ton of these sort of commercial plus companies that do a ton of good needed business by deploying these very cheap traps. Like it's like two, $3 traps and they deploy, you know, they'll go to your house and put these things in and they'll come back every week and check on them. They'll charge you a ton of money for this and they do this for businesses too. Um, but with this, like you send a guy or a girl out there in a truck, they deploy the thing and they don't come back until like there's actually something in there, right? So it saves companies a tremendous amount of money. It's wildly more efficient. Um, and you know the app will tell you if for some reason it drops offline. It happens now and then, and it'll say, "Hey, we haven't heard from this trap in in 25 hours," which is sort of the threshold. Um, it's awesome. I love it. So we're gonna do a webinar with those guys uh, the second third week of February, I think the 18th, um, and we're actually gonna give people the chance to buy the mouse trap through like this little tiny store that we have on Helium.com. I think we're gonna sell a ton of these things. Um, they are super cool. So, anyways, that, that's some of the customers. But as far as our like 
our enterprise relationship goes with customers, we, like I said, we're very different. We don't do like, uh, if people want to support engagement, like, I'll, you know, we'll figure out how to charge you a couple thousand dollars a month to support a big thing or, or something like that. But we're really trying to have the network be self-sustaining. We want the ecosystem to sort of grow with companies that are offering support for Helium products and services, and that's starting to happen. Um, does that answer your question? I forgot who asked it. Yeah, thank you. Cool. What else? I, I do got to go in about probably two minutes. Um, I apologize. We're cutting it early, but um, anything else? No, well, Mark, thank you very much for joining us. I, uh, I'm really, really happy. You, you do a great job of telling the helium story. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I pleasure. Uh, can, can you share the uh, the links you were talking about as far as the antennas and, and things like that go uh, that you mentioned? Yeah, so the best place is probably Discord for all this. Uh, so I'll drop a link to, uh, let's see, Discord. We have one of these fancy vanity URLs because uh, people pay for the for the community to be cool. All right, so there it is, discord.gg forward slash helium. Um, if you're not in Discord, definitely join it. We just crossed like 10,000 people in there last week, which is entirely oh, wild. Wow. Um, and I will say that Discord is super noisy. There's like, I'm looking at it now. I mean, there's probably, there's, there's 40 tech channels alone for different parts of the network. And we also have these local channels for like, you know, Stockholm. Yeah. And Let's set up a local channel for Frederick. Please do, yeah, ping me in Discord. I'll set it up for you guys. Um, yeah. And it does, like the local channels don't, and we also have these vendor channels, right? So for example, um, all the hotspot manufacturers have their own channels, Data Cake, um, company called Airly, which makes air quality sensors, has their own channels. Um, like, it's wild. Um, and it's super noisy, right? So if you don't mute things, you're going to end up pulling your hair out. I mean, case in point, I got nothing left. Uh, but uh, you can get a ton of value out of being in Discord. That's why we make all the sort of early announcements. Um, I will say I've been in community and open source software for probably 10, 12 years at this point. I've never seen anything as sort of collaborative and positive as the healing community. It's pretty, like, it's never ceases to amaze. Um, so I would say start with that uh, for antenna discussion. There's also a great channel for um, call, I'm looking now, uh, enclosures and off grid. So like if you have ideas about putting a car battery next to a hotspot on top of a, of a mountain or something, you wanna know how that goes, I, you know, people are in there. Yeah, um, so that's Discord. And then from there, uh, again, the other one is um, docs.helium.com. Um, and then what I'll do is uh, I'll export the slides I use as a PDF, and then I'll um, I'll have I'll send them to uh, Mark, and he can send them to the group. Cool. Awesome. All right, Mark. Thanks a lot, Mark. This was uh... uh yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is fun. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm I'm just Mark at Helium.com, M-A-R-K at Helium, and I'm far from Phillips in Discord. Reach out either way. Very easy. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to stay on in case anybody wants to hang with me. All right, thanks. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks, Thank Mark. you very much, Mark. Great Take it easy. Appreciated. All right, guys. Well, that was, I'm so glad he could join. You know, that's what he does, and he's good at it.